When the past it comes to haunt me It tells me what I've done It reminds me what's gone wrong And when my sins are laid before me My Lord, you take them on Yes, my Lord, you take them on So if I fall and if I fail Trust your mercy is greater than all of this. And if I bend and if I break, I'll trust the hands that hold me are greater than all my regrets. You are greater than all my regrets. You are greater than all my Father, I know I break your heart When I choose my way When I doubt your love But you take me as I am your child Yeah, you whisper in my ear Let's get up and try again So if I fall and if I fail Wow.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Gathering Online. Whether you're about to start March break with a week off and a vacation, or whether it's just a regular old Sunday, we're glad you're here. I know it was a rough start this morning since it was the time change and not the good one, but regardless, thanks for tuning in. We're glad you're here because at The Gathering, we exist to connect people to the love of Jesus, and we're starting that connection right now. I want to say thank you to those who joined us at our annual general meeting this past Wednesday. It went great. And one of the big things that happened was that there was some movement on our board of elders. Thank you again to Lori Dobson, who has served faithfully on the board these past few years. We're so grateful for her time and passion, and we will have a gift of appreciation for her at an upcoming in-person service. Thank you, Lori. And then we had three new elders elected to the board. So Rebecca Bussey, Linda McMillan Whalen, and Colin Miller, congratulations and welcome. We are thrilled to have you as new elders on our church board. Okay, there are a couple of things coming up that I want you to know about. The first of which is that Jeff is going to be running an online Alpha course starting the end of March. Now, Alpha is a course that creates a space where we have conversations about life and faith and Jesus. It's a great course for someone who might be new to church or new to a relationship with Jesus, but it's not just for new people, it's for anyone and everyone. And Jeff will be leading the course, so if you have any interest in joining Alpha, reach out to him. It's a short time frame to commit to, it'll be once a week and it will be online, and it will be something that you'll be grateful you invested your time in. You can email Jeff directly at jeff at thegatheringottawa.com and he can give you all the information you'll need to be able to join the course. Another course that's happening that I want you to know about is the marriage course. Check out this video. Marriage involves two people. They meet. You found me really attractive really quickly. <laughs> They fall in love. She's passionate. <laughs> they get married and embark on a relationship that's designed to be one of increasing intimacy. I really couldn't see my life without her. But that's not automatic. We have to keep working at our marriage. Because I wasn't getting much affirmation, I started getting that from other places. Our marriage was nearly over. If you start building good habits in your relationship, you'll be reaping the effects of those choices in five, 10, or 20 years' time. I can't let my past define my future. We have to build our own reality. The aim of the marriage course is to strengthen the connection between you as a couple. Love grows us. This is not a silly sentimental idea. This is science fact. How about one that we don't really hear about? How about this one, fun? Marriage ought to be fun. If you're not having fun, what's the point? The marriage course is built on universal principles that are relevant to any couple anywhere. In years to come, you'll look back on having built a marriage as perhaps the most important achievement of all in your lives. Craig and Linda are once again taking the lead on running this marriage course and they would love the opportunity to help you invest in some quality time to strengthen your relationship. The course starts April 8th. It runs Friday nights for seven weeks and it's also online this time. You can go to thegatheringottawa.com slash marriage course for more information and to contact Craig and Linda and to register. That link is also in your Gathering This Week email too if that's easier to find. One last thing, I want to let you know of another way to worship this morning, which is with your finances, because tithing is very much an act of worship, just like singing praises and digging into your Bible. So if you're feeling called to give this morning, you can go to thegatheringottawa.com to give as you feel God leading you to give. Okay, that takes care of that. And now it's time for a break. Get the kids. It's time for Kids Corner. A new mission for Saul. Our story today is from the New Testament. It happens after Jesus died on the cross and went back to heaven. Jesus' disciples were trying to do what Jesus had told them to do. They were telling everyone about the wonderful story of God's love, how Jesus had come and died for them to forgive their sins. Many people believed and became Jesus' new helpers telling others about him, and the wonderful news of Jesus spread, like sparks from a fire, 
to villages, towns, and cities. Every day, more and more people believed. And so, the family of God grew and grew and grew. One man was watching. I'll stop this, Saul said. Of all the people who followed the rules, Saul was the best. I'm good at being good, he'd tell you. He was very proud and very good, but he wasn't very nice. Saul hated anyone who loved Jesus. He traveled around looking for them. He wanted to catch them and put them in prison. He wanted everyone to forget all about Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus was the rescuer, and he didn't believe Jesus was alive either. You see, Saul had never met Jesus, but one day he did. Saul was on his way to Damascus when suddenly a dazzling light flashed like lightning. It was brighter than the sun. It was too bright. Saul shielded his eyes and fell to the ground. He heard a loud voice. It was too loud. Saul probably tried to cover his ears. Saul, Saul, said the loud voice. Why are you fighting me? Lord, Saul answered, who are you? I am Jesus, said the voice. When you hurt my friends, you are hurting me too. Saul's whole body trembled. Go to the city, Jesus said. I'll tell you what to do. When Saul opened his eyes, he couldn't see. His helpers had to hold his hand and lead him like a little child. Saul was blind for three whole days, and yet it was as if he was seeing for the very first time. Meanwhile, there was a man called Ananias who loved Jesus. Jesus came to him in a dream. Go to Saul and pray for him, and I will make him see again. Yikes! Ananias knew all about Saul and how he hated Jesus' followers. He was scared. But Jesus told Ananias, Saul is the one I've chosen to tell the world who I am. So Ananias went to Saul. Brother Saul, Ananias said, it was Jesus you met on the road. And Ananias prayed for Saul. Suddenly, Saul could see again, but he saw everything differently. He wasn't mean anymore. He even changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means small and humble, the very opposite of proud. It's not about keeping rules, Paul told people. You don't have to be good at being good for God to love you. You just have to believe what Jesus has done and follow him because it's not about trying. It's about trusting. It's not about rules. It's about grace, God's free gift that cost him everything. What happened to Paul? He met Jesus. So Paul had a new mission. He got a new job. He called himself a servant and traveled everywhere telling everyone about Jesus. And this was God's plan. Nothing in all the world would ever be able to stop it. Here are some things I want you to remember. First, when Jesus died on the cross, he gave us the free gift of eternal life. Second, how do we get Jesus' free gift? We just have to accept it. It's not about following rules. It's about God's grace when he died to forgive our sins. And lastly, when you have God's free gift, you need to share it with others just like Paul did. Get yourself a new mission and tell everyone about what Jesus has done for you. Here is a verse to help you remember. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Mark 16, 15.
Well, this morning, Jeff is speaking in our Acts series and his message is called Getting Organized. A lot of people have problems with organized religion and the institutional church, so let's talk about that today. While Jeff is speaking this morning, you can follow along with scripture references and take notes of your own with your YouVersion Bible app by finding our service under the events section. Before that happens, though, I'm going to read this morning's scripture and then I'm going to pray. First, our scripture is from Acts of course. Chapter 6 verses 1 to 7. It's a shorty this morning and I am reading from the New Living Translation. Seven men chosen to serve, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, We apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, 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 Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this early morning and for once again bringing us together online to worship you. We know that not everyone this morning was able to roll out of bed and watch church or go to church. And I ask you to reach out to those who are suffering this morning or who are far from you and who just need a touch from you. They just need to, you to be near to them. There are so many needs out there and so many desires of the heart and so many hurting people. So Jesus, again, I ask you to be near. As we step into your word this morning, help us focus on you. Teach us something new this morning. Open our hearts so that we can grow and move the way you want to move this morning. We are open and we are ready to receive what you have for us. So be with Jeff as he comes to speak now. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Jeff. See you next week. Have a great week. I miss you. See you soon. Well, hey, everybody. So good to have you with us here today. If you have your Bibles with you or a Bible app on your device, I want to invite you to open them with me to Acts chapter 6, where we're going to be looking at verses 1 through to 7, which is the passage that was just read for us a few moments ago, and a passage that shows us how the early church dealt with a particular conflict or issue that threatened to take the church and its leaders off track and create some division within the community of faith. It's a really interesting passage and a passage that I believe is loaded with wisdom and insight for us here today as we too can find ourselves sometimes navigating conflict and dealing with difficult issues as a church family. Now, by way of context, over the past number of weeks in our journey through the book of Acts, as we've been looking at the story of the early church, there's been a bit of a theme that has emerged as of late, hasn't there? That theme being this, it's opposition or resistance and conflict. As behind the scenes, even though he's not mentioned explicitly in the text, Satan is working overtime in opposition to the people of God, doing all that he can to stop the work that God is doing in and through the church as it grows and reaches more and more people with the gospel. And we saw this theme of opposition first introduced to the story back in Acts 4 as Peter and John first faced resistance and conflict from without, meaning externally from people 
outside the church. That's the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish high council, governing council. They tried to muzzle the church by threatening them with violence if they did not stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. But then at the beginning of Acts 5, we see the church then facing opposition from within as well meaning internally as Ananias and Sapphira, who, who were a married couple who were part of the church from within the church, they allowed their sin and their greed and their selfishness to get in the way of what God was doing, which threatened to corrupt the purity and holiness of the church and to take them off mission. As a result, we saw opposition from within emerge in the story. And then last week in the back half of Acts 5, we saw the church facing opposition from without once again. As the apostles were arrested and flogged and tortured for preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. Threatened again with even more violence if they did not stop. It's a pattern and a theme that has emerged in this story of the early church. Opposition both from within and from without, as Satan is doing all that he can to oppose and to attack and ultimately to stop the good and beautiful work that God is doing in and through the church as the gospel is spreading and people are coming to faith in Christ. That's the theme we see here in these first few or in these last few chapters. It's the theme of opposition and resistance and conflict, both from within and without. This morning then in our passage in Acts 6, at the beginning of Acts 6, and, and in keeping with this theme and pattern, we see the church now battling another attack once again from within. As opposition arises from within the church, from within the ranks of its own people, as a significant problem emerges and as the potential for infighting and ultimately for division becomes very real in the church. And it might be strange to say, but you know what? I actually find this story really encouraging. I don't know if I can say that, but it's true. I do. I find this passage about conflict quite reassuring and hopeful, as twisted as that might sound. And the reason for that is because this passage, it shows us, I think, that even the early church had its problems, right? Like, despite all the amazing things that God was doing, these people, this church, this community of faith, they weren't perfect. And they didn't handle everything perfectly either, right? Like, mistakes were made at times. And sometimes people got offended and hurt and reacted in ways that weren't always godly or beneficial to the community. And sometimes thing, things happened and decisions were made by the leaders that not everybody agreed with and things like this. They, they weren't perfect. And yet, despite their mistakes and their imperfections, the, the church, they continued to move forward together on mission, depending on the Spirit of God together and dealing with their stuff, with their problems together as best as they could before God. I find that really encouraging because it shows us, I think, that it's just normal for churches like ours to have problems at times. And it's normal for churches like ours to have challenges and to experience opposition, both from within sometimes and from without, whether we're talking about things like interpersonal conflict and disagreements in the church or leadership challenges or organizational issues and other problems that can sometimes emerge from within, or whether we're talking maybe about financial challenges or theological debates or outside influences that can also threaten the health of the church, right? Uh, challenges that can emerge from without at times. It's normal for the church to have problems sometimes. And so it should be expected, actually, as we see this happening here in the early church. Because if the early church had problems, we can expect to have problems too. It's normal. What's important, though, is that we refuse to let those problems, as normal as they may be, that we refuse to let those problems divide us, right? And that we don't give the enemy a foothold when we're in the midst of those problems by becoming bitter and living into dysfunction and unhealth, which only gives the enemy all the room that he needs to tear us apart as a church and to take us off mission. 
ultimately, we've got to find a way to deal with our problems and our disagreements and our, our, in our opposition from within and without in a God-honoring and healthy way, just like we see the early church doing here in Acts chapter 6. Now then, with all that said, I want to look at this very encouraging passage of Scripture with you, uh, where right away in verse 1, in the very first verse of this chapter, we are introduced to the problem. We see what the internal issue or the challenge was that the church was dealing with here in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, where we read this. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. Now let's just press pause right there for a moment. Luke, the author here, he starts the section out by reminding us of the incredible numeric growth of the church, as he has a few times throughout the book of Acts. In fact, it's, it's estimated that at this point in the story of the church, that the church is probably somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people all in, men, women, and children included, making this the, the world's very first mega church right here in the book of Acts. I talked about this a few weeks ago, right? It, it's amazing the kind of growth that this church was experiencing as God blessed them and his spirit moved through them and as God added to their number daily those who were being saved as we read about at the end of Acts chapter 2. But as many of you know, uh, growth, though it is a good and healthy thing and a sign of life, growth can be painful at times, sometime, uh, sometimes can't it? Literally, sometimes growth can physically hurt you. I remember my, uh, our oldest son, Brendan, when he was little, waking up in the middle of the night at times in pain in his legs, right? As his body grew while he slept and he literally experienced growing pains. Maybe some of you remember experiencing that when you were growing up as well, or maybe your kids experienced that. Growth, though it is good, can sometimes be painful. And this is true, not just physically, of course, but in other ways too. For example, if you own or, or work at a growing business, a business that is in high demand, you, you know just how challenging it can be to keep up at times, don't you? To hire enough people and to keep all your customers and staff happy and all this kind of stuff. Growth is good. It's, it's what you want, but it can present some challenges and complications for you as well, can't it? And it's the same thing in the church too, by the way. Growth is good, right? Growth is good. It's what we want. It means, or at least it should mean, that people are coming to faith and surrendering their lives to Jesus and becoming his followers, which ultimately is what, uh, you know, we're all about as a church. It's helping people get connected to the love of Jesus and become followers of Jesus. It's what we want. Growth is good, but it can also present some significant challenges for the community as a whole, as the church grows. It can complicate things, especially when the church grows too quickly or too rapidly, as Luke describes the early church's growth here in Acts chapter 6. Now, thankfully, I suppose, our church, the gathering, we've never had this problem, if you will. We've never experienced a season of rapid growth quite like this, where maybe we've doubled in size or tripled in size in a short period of time. We've had seasons of numeric growth over the years for sure, with people coming and growing and the church growing a little bit numerically here and there, which has been great. And honestly, I, I hope as we emerge out of COVID, out of this pandemic season together, that we enter into a season of growth together as we see people join in again and new faces come out as well. We, we want to grow for sure. But as far as explosive and rapid growth goes here at the gathering, that's just never really happened in the history of our church. And you know what? I'm actually quite okay with that, honestly. I don't really want to see our church grow so quickly, so rapidly, like we've seen some other churches grow and like the early church grew in the book of Acts. Not, not that I don't want to grow because of course I want to grow and not that I don't want to see people come to faith in Jesus because of course I want to see people come to know Jesus. But rapid growth, explosive growth where you double or triple in size in a short period of time, honestly, I'm just not so sure that that's all that healthy. 
in most cases. It's exciting, but it's not often healthy. As often what happens when churches grow like this, when they're in a season of rapid growth, at least here in North America, the reason why they're growing so much is because other Christians from other churches are, are joining that church, right? Because that church has become the flavor of the month and consumerism kind of motivates certain Christians to join that church and all that kind of stuff. They, they aren't necessarily new believers or seekers looking to uh, grow in their faith. They're just Christians looking to do something new, looking to go to a new church that they think might meet their needs better. And that's not often healthy because these Christians, they bring with them their baggage from their old church. And for that matter, the, the church, when the church grows this quickly, when it doubles or triples in size so quickly, usually that church doesn't have the systems and structures in place to support that kind of growth. It's not equipped to handle that kind of growth well. And so it means a lot of scrambling to connect everybody and to meet everybody's needs. And it can be a bit of a mess. And when a church grows too quickly, it just isn't often all that healthy for a whole bunch of reasons. And honestly, I've, I've seen too many stories like this over the years, and I've, I've journeyed with pastor friends uh, through seasons of growth in their churches, and I've seen them burn out, and I've seen the pressure and the weight of it on them, and I, I've seen the way this kind of growth has impacted people, and I just it's not healthy. And so I just know that that kind of growth, it's not always what it's cracked up to be. It's not always the best thing for a church. And so honestly, I, I don't want that for us. I don't think this kind of growth would be healthy for us, rapid growth. Instead, you know what I want increasingly the longer that I pastor this church and the longer that I'm in pastoral ministry? You know what my prayer and my vision for us is as it relates to this conversation about numerical growth? It's this, it's that we'd be faithful. That's it. That we'd be faithful, faithful to the mission and the call of God on our lives as a community of faith over the long haul as we follow Jesus together and work together to connect others to the love of Jesus, one person at a time. Where it's not really about numbers and how many people are coming and, and going or how big or small our community of faith is, but it's about being faithful and trusting God with the outcome, trusting God with the numbers. That's my prayer for our church, for me, that we'd be faithful, not necessarily big, because big doesn't always equal successful in the eyes of God. But that's the situation here for the early church in the book of Acts. They're growing rapidly in size as people are coming to faith every single day. Day. And so understandably, they're having a bit of a hard time keeping up with the growth, right? Like they don't have the systems or structures in place as of yet to support this kind of growth and to ensure that everybody's being cared for. They don't really know what they're doing. It's just sort of this grassroots movement that has exploded really, really quickly. And so inevitably, with that kind of growth and that lack of structure, it leads some people to get frustrated. And it leads some people into a place of disagreement and conflict as a result. Look again with me at how Luke describes the situation here for the early church in Acts 6 verse 1 where he says, But the, as the believers rapidly multiplied, as the church grew, there were rumblings of discontent. Rumblings of discontent. Or in other words, people started to talk as the church grew. And people started to grumble and complain, and even to talk bad about the leadership of the church, about the apostles. In fact, it's interesting, the word here for rumblings, or in other translations, grumblings or murmurings of discontent, and in the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's the same word that is used, actually, to describe the Israelites grumbling and complaining in Exodus 16, after they fled Egypt with Moses, if you know the story where as they wandered in the desert, they complained to Moses about Moses, about his leadership, saying, you know, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt or, or left us back in Egypt, at least then we'd have lots of meat and bread to eat. Why have you, Moses, they said, why have you brought us to this place of wilderness in order to starve to death? Why did you lead us 
out here. What are you doing? They're questioning and criticizing his leadership. They're complaining to Moses about Moses, which was criticism that neither Moses nor God really appreciated all that much, even though God heard their complaints and ended up providing manna and quail from uh, from heaven for them each and every day. It's the same word from Exodus 16 that we see here in Acts chapter 6, this word for rumblings of discontent as some members of the church began to grumble and complain against the leadership of the church, just like the Israelites did about Moses, which I think is Luke's way of saying, like, this isn't good, right? And this isn't healthy. It wasn't good or right for Israel to grumble and to complain against Moses after all that God had done for them and freeing them from Egypt. And it's not good or right for the church now here in Acts to grumble and to complain either as grumbling and complaining really does nothing except but divide God's people and put a wedge in between them. We see this very clearly, explicitly even, in some other places in the New Testament too, don't we? We're in Philippians 2, verses uh, verses 14, verse 14. Uh, For example, the Apostle Paul says that we are to do everything without grumbling and complaining. Everything. Do everything without grumbling and complaining, he says, which is a a tall order, isn't it? Because I don't know about you, but I like to complain sometimes. And I like to let people know when I'm not happy about things. And yet Paul in Philippians 2, as well as Luke here in Acts chapter 6, they're saying directly and indirectly that this kind of thing, grumbling and complaining to others, it has no place in the life of the church, especially when it's directed towards other people, when it's about other people and about the leaders of the church in particular, talking bad about others and complaining to others about your pastor or about the leaders, your elders or whoever in the church. It's not healthy for the church and it will only serve to divide the church and force people to pick sides and things like this. Even if you have a legitimate concern, even if there's a legitimate problem to be addressed, grumbling and complaining in the church is never healthy. It's not how God's people are to deal with issues. It's what Paul is saying in Philippians 4, and it's what Luke is saying here, I believe, in Acts chapter 6. It's a good word for us, isn't it? A good challenge for us to keep in mind. Not that it's wrong or bad to disagree with or even to challenge the leaders, the the pastors, the elders in the church about different issues. that There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's healthy. It's important. It's good to work through issues together as a community of faith. And I personally, as pastor of this church, welcome that. I want to hear from people if there's problems or concerns or ideas or whatever. I want to have conversations about how we can grow better as a church and become more healthy and all that kind of stuff. But rumblings of discontent and complaining and talking bad to others about the leaders in the church or about anyone else in the church for that matter, that's never good. That's never healthy. And it only serves to divide the people of God. And and the enemy loves to use that stuff to put a wedge in between God's people. And that's what's happening here in the early church, here in this passage in Acts chapter 6, isn't it? Where even though the particular issue that uh, caused these people to complain may have been uh, legitimate, they let grumbling and complaining creep in, which wasn't healthy, isn't healthy for the church. But now, what exactly were they grumbling and complaining about? What was the issue, the legitimate concern that these people had that caused them to have rumblings of discontent? Well, Luke tells us still in verse one, where he says this, here's the issue that they were upset about, legitimate issue. The Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Now, remember that the church here in the book of 
acts. Many of its people had actually sold their properties, right? And, and given their money to the leaders of the church, to the apostles, so that they could use the money to help meet the needs of the poor and the needy amongst them, including widows who in this patriarchal society often had nowhere to go to earn an income for themselves. They were dependent on the community of faith. And so here we see the Greek-speaking believers, meaning believers who had come from different parts of the continent and who spoke a different language and had different, a different cultural background. They were Greek in their culture. They were complaining against the Hebrew-speaking believers, meaning those who were from Israel as the leaders of the church so happened to be saying that the leaders of the church who ultimately were responsible for, for the funds that they had received from others, they weren't caring for everybody equally. And they were actually discriminating against the Greek-speaking widows, they said, caring for their own people first, their own Hebrew-speaking widows, while neglecting to care for the Greek-speaking widows as well, likely because of their culture and their language and their ethnicity and their background and all this kind of stuff. That was their complaint. That was their charge, which is actually a pretty big accusation, isn't it? One of discrimination and prejudice and racism, basically, where they're saying, hey, you guys aren't caring for everyone equally. You're caring for your people first, while our people, our widows, uh, are being neglected because of their ethnicity, and that's not right. Now, let's try to understand what's going on here a little bit better because it's clear from the text that the church did have a legitimate problem, right? That because the church had grown so quickly and because with that growth, there was lots of needy people looking to the church for support and for things like food and shelter and financial aid and so on. It's clear that the church was not really all that well equipped to do that well as of yet, were they? That because they didn't have the proper organizational structures and systems and, and uh, people in place in order to support people well, some people were falling through the cracks as a result. With these widows in particular, people who were in need of food being missed and over. Looked Not necessarily on purpose, but just because this thing had become so big, so quick that they couldn't keep up. Administratively, this thing had become too big for the apostles to handle on their own. And so that part of the complaint, it appears to be legitimate. Clearly there was, at the very least, an administrative problem here, a gap which unfortunately caused some of the widows to be missed in the daily distribution of food. But to jump from that to discrimination and prejudice and basically racism against Greek-speaking believers, well, that seems to be a bit of a stretch, doesn't it? Like there's nothing in the text here or anywhere else in the book of Acts to suggest that this was ever the case for the apostles, that they ever had an issue with Greek speaking believers. That part was added by those who were upset. They were just filling in the blanks themselves and assuming the worst about the Hebrew speaking believers where instead of seeing the issue for what it was, which was an administrative issue, an accident, they jumped to their own conclusions and attributed all these ugly and false and even racist motivations to them as a result. Now, now I wonder if that sounds familiar at all to you. If you ever do that, hopefully not the racist part, but do you ever assume the worst of others or, or attribute ugly motivations to others based on your own fill in the blank assumptions about them and why it is that they did or said the thing that they said said or did. You ever do that? Of course you do, right? We all do. We can't help it. We all have narratives that we go to in order to try to understand people's actions, don't we? Where we say things like, they're just doing this because they don't like me. Or they just said that because they're selfish. Or they're just acting that way because they want to impress other people. Or because they want to make me look bad. Or because they have some sort of evil intention. Whatever that inten intention is. We all do this at times as human beings. We're in our woundedness. We can sometimes assume the worst of others. And attribute false and even really damaging motives to them. 
And let me tell you, when that kind of thing happens in the church, where we fill in the blanks in this kind of way, as people were here in Acts chapter 6, and when that is directed towards the leaders of a church, to the pastors or to the elders, where people end up assuming all these terrible things about the leaders of the church without first talking graciously to them and asking questions and trying to understand and giving them the benefit of the doubt and committing to walking in love and trust and things like this. Or, on the other hand, when the pastor or the leaders of the church do that to congregants in the church and kind of, you know, assume the worst of them, whichever way it goes, that kind of thing can be absolutely devastating to the unity and the mission of the church. And the enemy can and will use it to divide the church and to take them off course, to take them away from their calling. Friends, we've got to guard against this kind of thing in our church and choose instead to take on a posture of love and curiosity, believing the best of one another instead of jumping to our own negative conclusions about one another, conclusions that often aren't even right. Okay, (laughs) moving on. We've only gotten through one verse here so far this morning, so I got to pick up the pace uh, just a little bit. Look with me now at how the apostles, how the leaders of the church responded to this criticism and to this to this problem, this opposition from within. We see some good leadership from them here, actually, I think. Verse 2. So the 12, what do they do? They called a meeting of all the believers. Like they got everyone in the same room, which is always a smart move in a conflict, isn't it? Where we stop talking about one another and start talking to one another Instead, it's what the apostles did here. They called the meeting and they got everyone in the same room together. And then look at what the apostles said as they met. They said, we apostles should not spend our time teaching, or sorry, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Now, what are they doing here? What, what are they saying? Well, they're taking ownership of this issue, aren't they? They're saying, guys, we know that we haven't been doing a good job with this food program. You're right. And we know and we agree with you that there's an issue here. But let's be clear. It's not because of discrimination uh, or racism or anything like that. It's because of administration. Running a food program is not our calling or our gift. Our calling and our gift, our focus is to be on teaching the word of God and ministering to people's spiritual needs, not running a food program. That's basically what they're saying here. They're owning the issue and they're clarifying the issue while also recognizing their own limitations around what they actually can and can't do. Okay, good leadership. Reading on verse three. And so brothers, here's our solution. Here's what we would suggest that we do. Select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom, like men who are full of character and who are trustworthy and actually gifted by the spirit to lead in this way. We will give them this responsibility, they said. Then the apostles, then we can spend our time in prayer and in teaching the word, or in other words, then we can do what we're called to do, what we're called and gifted to do, which is to preach and to teach and to pray while others can do what they're called to do, what they're gifted to do. Which, by the way, isn't to say that any one gift or calling is better or more important than another, like administration or helping others. But it is to say that we all have certain gifts that we are called to use in the church and that the pastor can't nor should do it all alone. And so when I or any one of us are operating out of our area of gifting, that's when things can get messy in the church and when details and people can get missed. Honestly, it's why I need a a Christian in my life and in the church. And it's why the church needs you, all of us together, using our gifts to see the church be all that Jesus gave his life on the cross for it to become. It's good leadership here from the apostles, isn't it? As they delegated authority and responsibility to the people in their community who were more gifted in this area than them. Reading on in verse 5. Everyone liked this idea, 
And they chose the following, Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, who we're actually going to hear more about later on in chapter 6 and in chapter 7. Philip, who we'll also hear about in chapter 8. And then five others, whose names are really hard to pronounce, and so I'm not going to attempt to do that. We don't hear about them again in the story of the early church here in the book of Acts, okay? Verse 6, these seven men who were likely Greek-speaking believers, right? People from within that group, probably, who had been complaining. They were presented to the apostles who, had pray, who prayed for them and laid their hands on them as they commissioned them and, and empowered them to lead in this way, to lead the food program. And then look at how the story ends in verse uh, 7 of chapter 6. So God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted to. Or simply put, they continued to grow and reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ as they operated in unity and in their areas of gifting, which is absolutely amazing, isn't it? Guys, this is what can happen when the church, when we deal with conflict and opposition from within in a healthy and God-honoring way. Where instead of assuming the worst of one another and grumbling and complaining about one another, we listen to one another instead. And we work together to solve whatever problems and whatever issues we may have, believing the best of one another as we do. And for that matter, this is what can happen when the church is well organized and when we commit to using our gifts and serving in the ways that God has called us to serve. People will come to know Jesus as a result. That's what will happen. And ultimately, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Not about numbers or church growth and look at how big and important we are. Not about our programs or getting our own way and having people do what we want to have them do, having the church do the things we think that the church should do. But it's about seeing people who are lost and far from God come to know Jesus, surrendering their lives to him, knowing that God loves them deeply and Jesus died for them so that they could experience eternal life starting here and now. That's the goal, the mission of the church is to see people come to know Jesus. And when we lose sight of that and we start grumbling and complaining and operating outside of our areas of giftedness and things like this, you know who misses out? Those very people. The people that we are called to reach and to serve with the gospel. That's who. That's who misses out. The people that God has called us to reach. It's why Satan works so hard, doesn't he? To divide people, to divide us in these ways because it makes us ineffective in our mission as the church in reaching people with the good news of Jesus. So friends, as we wrap up here this morning, let us as a community of faith and as individuals resist the temptation to assume the worst of one another. Let us watch our tongues. Let us bite our tongues, refusing to grumble and to complain about one another and even refusing to grumble and complain about our leaders in the church. Instead, let's commit to being part of the solution instead of the problem, using our gifts to serve one another and to serve our community with the gospel as God calls us to do, knowing that God will use us as we do these things to reach more and more people with the gospel, because that's his calling on us as a church, not to become this massive big church necessarily, but to reach people one person at a time with the good news of Jesus. As we commit to being these kinds of people, to dealing with our problems in these kinds of ways, God will use us and God will reach more people through us, which is my hope and prayer that we'd be found faithful to that call in the midst of all the different challenges that we sometimes face as people and as churches. Amen. Let's commit to being people like this. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we want to be effective missionaries for you, effective followers of Jesus for you, effective evangelists for you, where we tell others in word and deed, 
about the goodness of God and about the gospel, what it is that you, Jesus, did for us, for each and every one of us, so that we could be reconciled to God and experience eternal life starting here and now with you. But we confess that sometimes we get in the way of that very mission with our grumbling and complaining, our, our frustrations and concerns and, and um, uh, problems with people in the church, sometimes even the leaders in the church. Sometimes we can get in the way of that just by the ways that we deal with these things. We confess that. Would you teach us to uh, operate in line with your word here on this? where instead of grumbling and complaining, we talk to one another instead of about one another. And we commit to being part of the solution instead of the problem when we do face problems as a church community. And as we do that, as we use our giftings, and as we operate out of our calling, and as we commit to loving one another, assuming the best of one another, we invite you, Spirit of God, to use us to reach more people with the goodness of your message, with the truth of your message, that you are for us, not against us, and you long for each and every one of us to be reconciled to the heart of God. Use us as a church to do that, we pray. Make us healthy and whole in Christ. Spirit of God, make us like Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thanks for tracking along with us here today through this really, I found, a helpful passage of scripture as I opened it this week and started to prepare. I wasn't sure <laughs> where it would go. It's sort of a transitional passage, but I just was like, man, there's so much wisdom in here. So I hope it's helpful to you. I'm going to be off over the next week, uh, March break. I know many of you are away right now as well. So I hope that you all have an amazing spring break, but I'll be back with you in a couple weeks. In the meantime, I hope that you stay connected to God, spend time with Jesus, that you rest and relax in this season, this break, if you're taking time off and that we come back together rejuvenated and ready for what God has in store for us. Have an awesome week this week. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.
Trust your mercy is greater than